We are now uh, coming to uh, one of uh, the most interesting topics that we have tackled today, uh, the topic of uh, transition to decarbonization and how are we going to foot the bill and who is going to share into the cost. I am really humbled uh, to have uh, such a wonderful panel of uh, high profile people, decision makers, uh, who uh, across the board in terms of uh, representing the various stakeholders in the process. Um, I know that George Paliokrasas uh, from Watson Farley Williams has uh, quite a task to moderate this for an hour. Uh, so I will turn it over to George and I will let him introduce a panelist. And I would like to say a tremendous thanks to all of you. Uh, we are together from all over the world, uh, Singapore, London, uh, New York, Athens, and so on. So, uh, George, please go ahead and thank you. Thank you very much, Nicholas, and thank you very much to everyone on the Capital Link team for inviting us and for all the distinguished panelists for participating in this discussion, which I, which I also expect will be very enlightening and uh, hopefully exciting as well. Today we have Peter Lyle, who's the Global Head of Shipping at Anglo-American. Julian Proctor, who's a managing, the Managing Director of Entrust. Clara De La Torre, a Deputy Director General of the Directorate General for Climate Action at the European Commission. Simon Bennett, who's the Deputy Secretary General of the International Chamber of Shipping. Rasmus, uh, sorry, Stamatis Tandanis, Chairman and CEO of Synergy Maritime Holdings. Rasmus Bach Nielsen, who's the Global Head of Fuel Decarbonization at Trafigura. And Ted Jadik, who's Managing Director, CEO, and President of DNB Markets. Um, as Nicholas alluded to just now, this is a very hot topic. It is something of great interest, not just to the industry itself, but to the world as a whole, and therefore impacts the shipping industry. And, and, and you know, we, we have a, a very good cross-section of the industry and decision makers on this panel. And as, you, as the, uh, the introduction referred to by Nicholas, you know, there, there is a cost to going green, there is a cost of this transition. And therefore, what we want to do in, within this panel discussion is to initially look at the alternative proposals which are out there, both from the market and from regulators as to how this transition can be achieved. And then finally reach a, or try to reach a conclusion as to how the various stakeholders involved, whether that's governments, regulators, fuel producers, uh, charters and ship owners will share in this cost. So having said that as the introduction, what, what I also wanted to do is to turn to the various proposals which are which uh, exist at the moment in terms of how this transition can be achieved and how that cost will be covered. So we have the IMO's carbon levy uh, proposal at $2 per ton, which is to be used to create research and development in this area to find the fuel of the future. Or Then we have the, the EU's emissions trading system. The Marshall Islands and the Solomon Islands have proposed a US dollars 100 per ton levy. And then we also have Trafigura's proposal for a carbon tax levy at 250 to $300 per ton. And just as, as, you know, sort of to set the scene and initially, I, do, I would like to ask the participants here who either are sponsoring these proposals or have made the proposals themselves, if they just want to say a couple of words before we sort of then go into more detail considering the relative merits of the proposals. So I don't know if, if Clara, you would like to say a couple of words about the, the EU's proposal. Uh, Simon, I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about the 
the IMO's proposal, and then we'll go to Rasmus for, for Trafigura's proposal as well. Thank you very much. Good afternoon to everyone. Um, indeed, this is a very interesting panel. And we are in a very, as far as the union is concerned, as, as, as far as everyone, I'm sure, in a very, in a very critical moment where we are um, at the same time putting our path towards uh, climate neutrality, building steps for 2030 uh, increased ambition, and at the same time trying to recover from the economic crisis in which this uh, health crisis has, has induced ourselves. So um, what do we have in our, in our baskets, in our, in our table? We have a basket of measures. And uh, you know the European Union has always been of the, of the opinion that since we do not have a silver bullet solution uh, for virtually nothing, anything, um, we are going to propose, so we are, we are, we are, yes, we are going to propose a number of, of measures which have, I must say from the beginning, which have to be seen um, as compatible or, or with, with the vocation to be able to be um, coordinated or well blended with um, um, more global measures. We are looking at uh, from the regulatory side at, at the pricing of uh, carbon and extending our ETS system to the maritime uh, to the maritime sector. But not only that, we are also preparing, as you might have heard, um, uh, an initiative regulation about uh, fuels to take up uh, uh, alternative fuels and less less carbon intensive fuels in the maritime sector. We are looking at the energy taxation directive. We are looking at the alternative fuel infrastructures uh, directive, as well as the renewable uh, energy um, um, directive. So we are looking in, to all the different pieces of the of the regulatory framework that can help uh, uh, reaching uh, 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 the carbonization of our economy. It's also the maritime, I don't need to explain to you, maritime is not a sector which is on its own, maritime is, a, is part of, of, a, of, of a broader system of, a, of, a, of a transport system. And you know that the European Union has proposed a sustainable and smart mobility um, strategy recently at the end of last year. And there we are aiming at supporting the Green Deal, um, the Green Deal um, objectives while at the same time, at the same time, um, 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 honoring the demand, the increasing demand for mobility, both of passengers and freight. But we have, we are, we are putting our, our side in a more sustainable overall system. For all this to happen, we need, as we know, a huge transformation. And therefore we are also investing uh, um, considerably in research and innovation. We know that research and innovation are sources of growth, but we know as well that without, um, without cleaner technologies, cleaner, mate um, lighter materials, uh, um, more intelligent systems, we will not manage to decarbonize the maritime sector as, as other sectors as well. So with all this panoply of, of measures, we want to we would like them to be well, uh, well coordinated with measures in the context of IMO, with global measures, and we would like, of course, to be all this to be seen in the context of all the demands that we are doing in order to comply with the with the Paris Agreement. The last word, uh, we all uh, something that is very entrenched in our in our policy is that. Uh, all sectors have to contribute to this decarbonization, to the decarbonization ambitions of the union, and hopefully to the decarbonization ambitions of the world. And the maritime sector, I know it has its difficulties. I know it has specific uh, features, but I'm sure we will find a way for this sector to, to, to contribute. Thank you. Thank you very much, Clara. Uh, Simon, do you want to give the, the perspective from the IMO? Yeah, thank you. But I mean, to be clear, um, I'm not speaking for the IMO. I'm speaking for the International Chamber of Shipping. But and the <clears throat> um, proposal you referred to for a um, five billion dollar R and D fund. That's a proposal which originally came from the industry. It's now supported by a broad cross-section of governments. Of course, it's not yet been agreed by the IMO. Um, 
the first thing I should say is that our proposal, it's not a market-based measure and it's not intended to be an alternative to a market-based measure. And ICS and the other international um, representative associations, we all support the concept of an IMO market-based measure. And in fact, we're going to be making an important announcement um, about this in preparation for the big MEPC meeting that takes place in June. Um, but the, the specific reason why we propose this $5 billion fund is because the targets that have been set for the industry by IMO and by um, the UNFCCC, they can only be established if we actually see the appearance of zero carbon ships by 2030. And the straightforward reality is that at the moment, the technology which you need for ocean going ships, it simply doesn't exist in a, in, in a form that is going to allow the appearance of viable ships to appear by, by 2030. We know there are various piecemeal projects taking place around the world. We know um, we've heard the, the European Commission talking about funding for transition. But frankly, there is nothing on the scale that is going to be required in order to kickstart the acceleration of the massive research and development that we're going to need to see over the next 10 years. So that, that's why the industry has made its proposal um, purely for the purpose of accelerating um, R&D through a, a global collaborative mechanism. But just to emphasise, this is not an alternative to an MBM. Um, our only question about a market-based measure is, well, firstly, we think a market-based measure has to be global in order to work. Um, whatever the European Commission comes up with in its canopy of um, proposals, that's only going to cover 15% of the emissions that come from the global fleet. So we're a global industry and we require a global solution uh, through um, the IMO. Um, I'll leave it there because otherwise I'll end up making a speech. Okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Simon. So Rasmus, now you know, you're the proponent for your company's um, uh, proposal as well, and and maybe an explanation of how this differs from the two previous proposals which have been um, uh, discussed. Yes. Okay. First of all, thanks for inviting today. I, I, it's a it's a great pity we can't be face to face. It's such a deep topic, and there's so many angles and variables to talk about. Just a few things to point out from from what Simon and Clara says. Listen, it's it's it is it's a great chance for for everyone because transition is in the process happening. We've seen through COVID that people have had more time to think about what's important for the future. Uh, potentially, that's one of the big positives from COVID. Actually, uh, we realized that transition absolutely must happen yeah, on the renewable space and, and, and the decarbonization and shipping. So very much agree on that with Clara. What you say, Simon, I, I'm very pleased to hear that ICS now is saying they will support publicly a market-based measure, which is the first time I hear that. So that's absolutely an achievement already in terms of moving mindsets and where companies and organizations are going. It follows in line with what we have seen since we came with our IMO uh, uh, global carbon levy proposal that we launched in September last year. Uh, so transition is indeed happening and, and it's absolutely spectacular. It's a huge challenge uh, and, and we all need to chip in as Clara is saying. That's also why we have proposed in our carbon levy and now I go in depth with what it is, where we're saying we propose that the charters are paying the bill when they charter higher emitting ships. So we, we completely agree that we all need to participate in paying the bill in the decarbonization. Um, a little bit about our uh, carbon levy proposal. Uh, again, we cannot formally uh, propose that within the IMO ourselves, uh, but the concept is where we have seen it is as follows, where there is a benchmark established on the key transportation fuels, uh, inspiration from the California low carbon fuel uh, scheme, the LCFS, which has worked very well, where you give fuels a carbon intensity profile. Transportation fuels, you don't have that many, so it's not that difficult a task. We believe it has to be done on a full life cycle assessment basis, which currently is not happening within the IMO, although there's discussions on how you assess 
emissions uh, from transportation fuels. Obviously, methane slippage is, which is a very potent uh, CO2 uh, carrier. Uh, we believe that has definitely to be accounted for. Anyway, so what we propose, again, you, you, give, you give a benchmark when you charter high emitting ships, charters pay, and then you create a fund where you can, where you then have money to subsidize the use of low and zero carbon fuels. We believe by far a significant uh, amount of the, the levy collected should go back into the industry, i.e. to subsidizing the use of zero and low carbon fuels. We have proposed a small part into R&D and a small part into small island states and other exporting nations who will suffer from having significantly increased transporta transportation costs. What, what we frame it as is a partial fee-based system. Since September, we have seen the mindsets moving from here to here over the last eight months. And last, yesterday I was on the Stanford panel and I was asked, so when do you think we will see peak CO2 from shipping? And I said, well, it totally depends when regulators act. Because if we get regulation and transparent and enforceable regulation, then indeed we can see the decarbonization happening much, much faster than what people think. And here I disagree with your comment, Simon. The only comment I disagree with you, technology is there. We know that the engine is ready by 24, 25. We know from Traffic World that there's billions of dollars ready to invest into the hydrogen. And we believe transport fuels of the future are hydrogen based, i.e. green methanol or green ammonia. The carbon content from that is by far the most uh, admirable uh, way, which is an 85 to 95% emission saving versus the transport fuels of today. The challenge which we have and that everybody has today, and I'll try not to make this speech too long, yeah, but the challenge that we all have today is if you offtake green hydrogen or green ammonia on a 10 year forward contract, delivery 2026, the price is 450 to 500 euros per metric tons. And the energy density of the, the green fuels is significantly less than the fuels today. So the problem is nobody can in scale go and offtake these fuels because they are so uncompetitive. So what we need, we need regulators to make them competitive. Yeah, The industry is ready. And, and why is Trafigura so engaged in this space? I mean, we have $60 billion of credit lines and everybody is telling us and, and we, we know that we need to decarbonize the infrastructure. But the challenge again is it's so non-financially viable today, so we need regulators. When regulators is there and, and, and when they manage to regulate this, then I think the industry has a real chance to go and decarbonize. And the way we see it, it's a historical challenge, it's a historical opportunity, and there's also historical responsibility on all of us to go and make it happen. Uh, one last comment, and then I leave the word, sorry, George. Um, it's very important that, um, that politicians realize, and I'm not thinking so much within the EU, but also around the IMO, how important it is and how big a mandate that they have as of today. So anyway, thanks, I'll leave the, the table, yeah. Thank you very much, Rasmus. And um, the, the, the initial comments uh, really do set the scene for, for, for the discussion here because we have we have you know three different proposals with some common elements. I, I just wanted to touch on one thing to sort of take the lead from what you said, Rasmus, right now about the need for regulation. So at this point, you know, there there isn't exact clarity from the regulatory perspective. There are the targets for 2030, there are the tar targets for 2050. So what I would like to ask is, how does the industry prepare itself? What measures should be taken in the interim before there is clarity on, on the, from the regulatory aspect? So I'd, I'd like to invite the others who haven't spoken so far, you know, what, what is it that can be done? What is it that should be done in this period until that clarity uh, arrives. Maybe um, I can just say a few words before I think I think Peter wants to say something as well. The uh, so, so his, his fingers moving. Um, we're an owner of environmentally advanced vessels. Um, the business that, that we have is a business called Purus Marine and it's focused on uh, 
a wide variety of different sectors from offshore wind all the way through to industrial shipping, which I think Rasmus's and Simon's comments have been mostly um, tailored towards. Because I think if you look at certain sectors, um, George, the, the technology is already available here today. If you would look at the short sea sector, if you were to look at ferries, there's very viable technology which is in place. So I would say part of the, 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 uh, the question is to do with the regulators. I would say the real question is customers and ultimately what they are demanding. Because customers, if we think about all of us as potential passengers on, a, on, on, on ferry systems, we can be demanding and we are demanding to have low carbon transportation. We, want to have, we don't have air pollution in our backyard. There is a massive focus on these issues. So it's the customer which really takes, um, in my mind, the most material role. And the regular, regulator, while it's important, I think takes very much a secondary position in this, in this regard. If you then sort of focus on the difficult question, which is the hard to abate sector being in desperate shipping, it's a very different situation. But the customer still reigns supreme. If you think about companies like Anglo-American, which have taken very strong leadership roles, they've got a climate strategy, they think they're very thoughtful about their scope three emissions, they're taking a, um, uh, an important leadership role at an industry-wide level as well, they are setting standards. So again, it's the preeminence of the customer. Um, when it comes to the, the regulatory side, I think uh, what the EU is doing is very important as well. The EU historically, if you think about the aviation sector, has pro again provided that catalyst when it came to the scheme, the course scheme, which eventually was set up. There was a lot of tension between the, the, the United Nations aviation body and what the EU is doing. But ultimately, that tension created a scheme which ended up working at a regional level. And without that tension, without that big impetus from the EU, nothing would have happened. So again, I, I share many of uh, Simon Bennett's comments from the ICS, but you do need to have the impetus from the regulators. And sometimes that won't happen at a global level. You may have the Chinese or the Europeans, which is what's happening right now, which are pushing to get the IMO to move. So I think the, 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 the story that I, will, I, I would like to really share is one about customers. They're driving it anyway. It's happening. All you've got to do is look at what Amazon's doing, what Musk is doing. Think about the big mining companies like Peter Runs. That's already happening. They already have net zero carbon strategies. So frankly, the regulators are important, but customer reigns supreme. And all of this is a little bit academic because when they say we need to have low carbon freight and they're already incorporating shadow carbon prices, if you don't deliver it, they won't be a customer any longer. So I'll just pause on that point, George. Thank you, William. Peter, you you wanted to, to speak as well now. Yeah, I was just gonna gonna add to that and um <laughs> and, and probably just resonate really what 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 Julian's already alluded to. I think um yeah again there, there is a place um for for regulation um and and the points made around a global um, perspective in rela in relation to to that you know makes a lot of sense. Um, I think you know there, there's concerns about how. Um, I guess funds and um, uh, is, is distributed and, and, and used, and, and, and we want to make sure that that's done in a in a most appropriate way. But but yeah, look, I think for us as a, as a large mining company, um, you know, we, we're very much focused on our our scope three emissions. Um, we've set targets uh, in relation to our ocean freight, uh, um, controllable ocean freight, which you know, is, is, is much stricter than what um, we would anticipate uh, under the IMO. Um, and again, I think as Julian alluded to, it, it comes from our customers uh, and our customers' customers, um, you know, where, you know, we, we are needing to look at how we reduce our emissions in our operations, our scope one and scope two. Um, and we've, uh, you know, very clear net zero targets in, in our operations in, in South America and, and South Africa. Um, and that expectation is, 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 is built right across the business. Um, but we also need to do it in application. Um, and again, it's, it's because those customers are requesting it um, and, and their customers are requesting it. Um, and, and if we want to continue to be in the game, if we want to continue to be relevant, if we want to continue to be competitive, um, we need to move forward. We can't wait for um, regulation. Um, we need to continue to move the dial forward. And I think that's the interesting piece that we've sort of really discovered and pleasing bit that we've discovered 
um, you know, in our journey over the last, you know, really only two to three years, I guess, um, where we've been working down this path is that um, you tend to be knocking on an open door uh, when you want to have these discussions with uh, with a lot of the, the players in the shipping market, certainly the, the respected ones. There's challenges there. We understand that. Um, uh, commercial, technology, infrastructure. Um, but I think when you, when you have a conversation around this is where we want to get to, this is why we have to get there, um, and it's the right thing to do as well as the need to, to continue to stay relevant and, um, and, and effective in, in our business. Um, the collaboration is, is very much forthcoming. Not saying it's easy, um, but I think, you know, it, it is uh, really pleasing that the, the momentum that we have um, and, and forums like this to be able to, to discuss some of those challenges, which are which are pretty pretty consistent. But yeah, I would just reiterate the the point before. I think it, you, the, the regulation is important. Um, technology is uh, advancement is 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 very important as well. And it's not just the vessel; it's the infrastructure. That's the thing we need to remember as well. Um, mm-hmm. But I think it's that 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 desire that's coming from our customer and our customer's customer that's that that's really um, has a lot of power and a lot of influence. Um, and, and which is which is a good thing. Thank you very much, Lisa. Yes, Ted. Yeah, I'd just make a quick comment, um, and I I certainly agree with with what's been said about the importance of the customer and the fact that the customer is 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 really driving this, and you know we see that consistently across you know kind of our client base. You know, our our, our clients are getting on with it, um, and and it's driven by the demands of the market. Um, However, the regulatory side is what's needed to create the level playing field. The level playing field is critical uh, for making that investment decision. Um, I think it's going to be very tricky for a ship owner to make uh, the next big investment decision uh, in a new technology driven uh, vessel um, without a without a level level playing field from a regulatory perspective. Thank you very much, Ted. I think I really have to now go to Stamati because, because of, particularly because of Ted's comment just now about you know the, the difficulty for the for owners to be able to make these decisions where 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 you don't have the the regulatory framework and 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 not necessarily clarity from the technological point of view as well. So as the representative here, not only of of synergy, but also of the owning community. It's, it's left to you to, to answer this question. Well, thank you, George. We're actually the only shipping company attending this panel. Uh, as a quick comment, I must say that uh, there's no question that the transition needs to happen and to, we fully support it. Synergy has been uh, a pioneer uh, since uh, 2015 in various ways. We have reduced our emissions by 15 to 20% on our existing ships. And uh, as far as the IMO 2020, we were one of the very, very few companies out there that we actually implemented this plan in comparison and in partnership with our charters. So, you know, we fully support Clara's and everybody else's um, views that this has to be shared among all the parts of the uh, chain as far as this is concerned. Now, as a quick comment, you know, there are about 100,000 ships out there right now, 100,000 commercial ships out there. And that's about 2 billion deadweight tons. Uh, in dry bulk in particular, you have like 12,400 uh, dry bulk ships uh, uh, carrying about 1 billion tons, uh, deadweight tons at any given time. So, you know, to replace uh, this amount of vessels, uh, two thirds of this amount has been built uh, from 2012 uh, and earlier than that. So. Uh, you know, any billion set aside to replace the existing uh, deadweight, uh, you know, transporting goods uh, and raw materials at sea, <laughs> it, it really has to be very, very significant, you know, to replace all that deadweight uh, cargo carrying capacity. Uh, at the same time, I must say that commercial shipping and especially dry bulk is not like a luxury travel. You know, we are using our ships at the orders of our charters to transport uh, grains uh, to feed the population, iron ore to build bridges and uh, infrastructure in various parts of the world. So we're a very, very essential part of, you know, the logistic uh, chain uh, as far as this is concerned. So, you know, from our end, 
the sharing of uh, the idea because this panel now is about who's going to share the cost and how, how the cost is going to be shared, not who's going to pay for it, but how it's going to be shared. Uh, you know, we have to be pragmatic and realistic uh, about the cargo carrying capacity of the ships in the water, the cargoes that are being transported and how vital uh, what we do is for the world. So, you know, this is my five minute, uh, two minute, um, you know, introduction to this panel. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, one of the one of the comments that was made in this discussion now, uh, in in the responses which were given, one word which was used is collaboration, and certainly one thing that has come across this discussion, but also previous discussions on this topic, is the absolute need for collaboration. In terms of you know that this is too big an issue for 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 one stakeholder or one group of stakeholders to to deal with so in terms of practical ways in which this collaboration is being uh, enhanced or implemented i would just i I'm, I'm interested in your views as to how that's being done because because it has to be said that you know that the, the shipping industry isn't necessarily well known for collaboration julian made the comment about about aviation and and the steps that were taken there and the and the tensions that existed before before some you know this difficult decisions were taken and a direction of travel was found but you know the shipping industry is far more fragmented uh, you know stamatis mentioned 100,000 commercial ships so I, I just wanted to you know discuss and consider on the what level and what basis are these collaborative steps being taken? And I can see that Rasmus is very keen to um, to take this on. Yes, okay. So collaboration is fantastic and it's great. And, and we believe in that. Actually, earlier today, by coincidence, we've announced our co-sponsoring of the Man Green Ammonia Engine. I'm not here to market that. That's a collaboration, that's a sponsoring, and that's enabling man to push forward probably faster on the technology development. It's an ESG part from our side. Collaboration, unfortunately, cannot fix the price gap. Yeah, The price gap and the price differential on current fuels and low and zero carbon fuels is too significant that col collaboration between different industries in our supply chain can fix it. And, and it's, it's a key challenge. And, and, and yes, we all want to work towards the same goal. And Peter, you, I mean, yes, I, I very much agree in what you're saying that, that we can all chip in. And in our proposal, we're, we're actually proposing that charters pay the bill for chartering high emitting ships. However, there is such an opportunity right now that if you have the, the regulatory framework, it will just give such a huge pool of billions of dollars of investments coming in to create the green hydrogen that we so urgently need. And it's a little bit the chicken, the egg situation, because if, if you don't have the fuel, then you won't have the investments into the ships or the retrofitting. Mm -hmm. Trafigura has been buying and selling ships for three and a half billion dollars the last four years. So we very much into like also, okay, what does it take? And for us right now, probably to go ahead and, and do things in the future, we do need a more clear regulatory framework because the price difference is just too significant in order to justify a massive wave and a massive transition. It can probably take place in small scale if nothing is done because we all need to do it. But the challenge we have societies overtaking us right now and requirements from everyone, whether that's financiers, regulators, uh, shareholders, employees, etc. We need to decarbonize a lot faster than what the current framework is allowing for. So, so I think we need to be incredibly ambitious about that we just need to push on all all limits and, 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 and again, but again, so to answer your question, Sarah George, I talk a little bit away from it. Collaboration is great, but it cannot fix that price difference that is there, which is a very significant in today's world. Thank you very much, Rasmus. And I know that Stamati wants to um, speak now and then after with uh, Julia. Yes, speaking about uh, collaboration, Synergy is the living example of how uh, a close cooperation and partnership between the shipping <laughs> community and the charters can actually work and implement a certain regulation which is for the best of the environment. Uh, as far as IMO 2020, as I mentioned before, the cost of the scrubbers that we installed on our ships 
were done in partnership with some of the world's largest charters. We shared the cost, we shared everything, and everybody's taking advantage of, uh, you know, whatever we, the good thing that we created. So, you know, if charters and ship owners uh, sit together and they discuss a realistic plan as to how to share the cost of the additional incremented, incremental investment uh, is required in order to do that, then I'm pretty sure that the industry is going to thrive. So, you know, uh, collaboration is good. We have done it. We have done it with some of the world's largest charters. So if you sit down, you discuss how much this thing costs, uh, who's going to pay for it, how are you going to share it, and who's going to, you know, gain from the benefit. I'm pretty sure that the commercial, uh, you know, solution can be found like we have done very successfully on the IMO 2020. So we have done it and it works. So we're open to that. Maybe I'll just add a few points, if I may, George, because I think if you break it down, uh, you can look at different regions, geographies, or different sectors, because the, the I think part of the question regarding collaboration uh, depends upon that. If you take Japan, for example, which is, is, is a country I know incredibly well, having lived there for a good part of my life, there's phenomenal amounts of collaboration between the industrial complex, so the big end users, the ship owners, the shipyards, the universities, they have a very strong industrial complex and they are solving the, the question when it comes to electrification in the short sea, but also the utilization of hydrogen and ammonia. And don't forget, they were the pioneers of LNG 40 years ago. They have a lot of expertise in these cryogenic um, uh, carbon sources and they will solve this again. I also then would change gear and look at Europe and say there's phenomenal amounts of um, development happening when it comes to the, the electrolyzers, the, the, the research going behind electrolyzers and hydrogen, the, the development of infrastructure. And Germany and France are taking phenomenal leadership roles in the shore side development of these and these very important industries to the point that Rasmus um, mentioned before. So again, this is industrial collaboration. It's happening completely with deep sea or certain parts of deep sea, but it certainly is happening in regional Japan and most of the mega carriers are doing it. It is absolutely happening in certain parts of uh, European waters and certain parts of the larger elements of deep sea shipping, for example, large bulkers or very large gas carriers. This collaboration is absolutely happening. I think when it's, where it's more challenging is the medium sized ships. You don't have the the same customer pressures, you don't have the same stakeholder pressures, which you do for the bigger players. If you're in the cruise industry or you're in the gas carrier business, you have big stakeholder pressure and you move very rapidly. If you're a handy size owner, not so much. Mm. Mm. Thank you, thank you, Julian, for that, for that point. Um, I just want one other point on the, just to stay on the collaboration piece for, for a moment. I just wanted to, to ask Clara, in terms of, you know, the, the, you, you expressed very clearly the EU's proposal. Can you also tell us how that works? How does the EU work in combination with the IMO and other, other regional bodies or international bodies as well? because one of the comments made previously was that shipping is a global industry. Uh, and and you, you recognize that, and you made the point that we have to have a basket of measures, that we will work with other people, but we need, and using Julian's word, that impetus. We need to give this impetus in order to create a global change. So if you could just explain a little bit how that, how you interact with the other bodies. Thank you. Indeed, cooperation is, is one of the, the key features of, uh, of, uh, of policy making in the union in, in, in many different realms and not less than this one. So, as you know, the European Union has always been active in the in the uh, in IMO and has always been trying to convince different parties on, of the rationale of a certain number of measures. And um, I think I think of several speakers of the of this uh, panel, uh, Julian Rasmus uh, and others, mentioned exactly something which on which uh, I mean we explicitly work is that we know that things are not moving quickly enough at the global level. There might be good reasons for that, but it is not enough. 
So we need, we need, we need in the union, we have, uh, we have uh, to honor our uh, promises, our ambitions of reduction of emissions. And we have to make sure that this is done. We would prefer to do all this at totally global level, but we see that despite, yes, there are, there are advancements and progresses. We know the strategy that was adopted a couple of years ago by MO to be by reducing emissions by half by 2050, all this, and this is very good. We're working with that. But since we feel we are not working quickly enough, we need to, to, to move uh, and put the pressure uh, the, the peer pressure, we know very well that this is something that, uh, that works very well. We are not disregarding, nevertheless, we are not disregarding this global uh, and the consequences that it can have. So in the shaping of our DTS, we are, we are um, trying to make sure that we are not discriminating. I mean, the first interest in having a competitive industry, a maritime industry, is the union, because it has an industry. So we are interested, legitimately interested, in keeping this uh, competitiveness, uh, competitive edge of the industry. So this is why we want to be flag neutral. It doesn't matter where the where the ship comes from. It has to be subjected to the same rules. It has to. We have to to to. Um, I have lost my thread. Um, it has to be a, a root based. A root has always to be treated in the same way. And when, uh, when I think Simon was saying, rightly so, that from the union side, we are only covering part of the emissions, a small part of the emissions, true, true. But we have to start with something and it will depend, and it has not been decided, on what is the geographical scope that the union would, would propose, at least the commission would propose to the parliament and the council about the ETS. Because one thing is clear is that intra-EU voyage will be covered. That's for sure. That's the, the, the commitment of everyone. Now, we could think of different um, scenarios where we could have 50% of the, of, of the, uh, all the external voyage, the outcoming voyage, the incoming voyage, and there we'll be addressing even a higher part of the emissions. So um, to say that, yes, Cooperation is absolutely of the essence. Um, um, I think Rasmus said that you have a sector which is, or you do it yourself, George, very really fragmented, exactly. And where you have many different actors from with many different uh, um, uh, interests. I have been seeing that when I was working in, in transport technologies. And I think uh, one of the successes of the European Union, together with the sector, is precisely to have managed to put together a, a partnership, public-private partnership for zero uh, waterborne transport. I know this will not solve all the problems. I know this is not enough money, but this shows two things: is that when you we are together, you move, uh, you move, uh, you move better, and that uh, when one decides to 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 invest in research and innovation, this gives a push to many other things. So cooperation. This should not be an excuse for not moving forward. I hope I was not too blunt. <laughs> thank you. No, thank you very much, Clara. That was very clear. Um, I just want—I just wanted to also take a point that uh, Julian mentioned as well uh, previously, where, where in terms of you know, because we're, it's clear that in terms of the regulatory environment, that's something that's evolving. You know, for example, Rasmus. Is making the point that it's uh, it's actually vital that that process be accelerated. Mm. Uh, Julian Julian, however, made the point that actually, in a number of the sectors, changes is, is being is being enforced in any event through customers. Mm. But he did he did give an example of you know where the customer pressure will not be as as uh, you know. As strong as in other cases, and and that, that's for example in Samati in your in your area. So where do you feel, let's say, the pressure for change? You you know you don't have cruise ships, you don't have ferries, so you know, you are operating in the in the dry bulk sector. Where do you feel the pressure for change within in, right now? Well. Thanks, George. Uh, we operate our ships uh, that are actually the largest uh, conventional size uh, of the dry bulk segment, and we do most of our cargoes are uh, 
uh, effectively iron ore. Iron ore, as you know, is used for infrastructure projects uh, around the world. So, you know, it's a very vital thing. And we don't operate so much in, you know, territorial waters. Uh, most of our routes are between Brazil and China and China, sorry, Australia and China. So, you know, we do like very, very long voyages, um, three or four voyages a year just to do a round trip um, around Brazil. So you have to take into consideration that the largest vessel, uh, you know, the largest, the problem, <laughs> and uh, especially on, uh, you know, dry bulk and on the containers, the largest containers that actually adds up to a uh, bigger and bigger problem because the world is in great demand for raw materials and, uh, you know, commodities for to feed the population. So, you know, it, it's very important that we all collaborate and change. So I, I, I was thinking about it and, you know, in order to build a bridge somewhere and produce, you know, the required steel, you need to produce that steel either from Anglo-American, <laughs> from Peter's company or from Vale. Uh, that needs to be transported down to the ship and the ship will take it to a different place where it's going to be converted into a steel. So the actual carbon uh, required in order for something from a raw material to become the end product, a product that is going to be used, uh, you know, the, the whole amount should not be paid by shipping. Shipping is only a small part of the whole equation, but the overall carbon emissions in order to produce the final project, uh, product is something that needs to be shared all across uh, the logistical chain, the supply chain. So for us, the most important thing here is the fair distribution of the cost among the supply chain. That, that's all we're saying, you know, every part of the supply chain needs to be responsible for the overall bill. So, you know, uh, I'm seeing reports that a certain thing emits uh, carbon from the minute that it's produced but it's not going to be paid by shipping. I mean, you know, we're not going to be paying the bill for something that is required uh, in order to be extracted from the earth or, you know, whether that's oil or iron or so. We need to be very, very careful as to how we allocate the overall emissions of that uh, into the whole supply chain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stamati. I'll, I'll go with Rasmus first and then Ted in, in, in that order. So just a little bit about to touch on the collaboration and and, and this shipping uh, charters should definitely pay the bill together with the owners etc to give sort of a, an example of the transition how much it can change today if you have regulation where charters know that it's cost neutral to charter low and zero carbon ships tomorrow probably Trafigura and others would go out and charter 10 ships delivery 2025 yeah however and just to go back a little bit and challenge uh, the today on 2025, we will not charter any ships with current fuels. And this just to give Clara a little bit of a, an understanding and feeling of like how, how strong is the appetite for low and zero carbon ships if you have a clear regulation. And that's just our point that we're trying to drive forward. If a regulation is there, the whole industry will be driven much faster forward because the big charters, they are willing to go out there on forward basis and make that transition happening. But without that, then there's a lot less encouragement to go and do it. And it's not only Trafigur, I believe it's everyone who would go and, and charter those ships on forward basis if we have clarity. So it's just sort of to, to put the emphasis of, well, how, how ambitious are we and how ambitious are the regulators? And I really appreciate everything you're saying, Clara, that you're pushing it forward. And we believe that's great, by the way. It's really fantastic. I think the EU is instrumental in also pushing the EU at the moment. So credits for that. Uh, but, but just to, to make the message very clear, the charters are totally there to make that transition happen and much, much stronger than I think anyone believes today and sees. So that's just the encouragement. Thank you. Thank you, Rasmus. Uh, Ted? Yeah, thank you. I, I wanted to uh, kind of touch on the on the question of pressure, which which uh, which came up a few min minutes ago, and and some of the comments that, that Julian made about uh, you know where is the pressure coming from? It's it's coming from the customers, correct? It seems to be more visible in 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 in, in certain sectors, maybe sectors that in particular touch uh, retail consumers like cruise, um, uh, or in some of the larger bulk sectors where, where you have, uh, let's say, a larger, more visible uh, multinational companies on, on the other end of the, uh, of the charter party. Um, 
but 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 from my perspective, um, you know, every ship owner, whether you're a large ship owner, a medium sized ship owner, or a smaller ship owner, and, and regardless of what type of tonnage, you know, deep sea tonnage you're operating, you, you all have the same guidelines. They all have the same guidelines that they that they need to meet. Um, uh, and 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 so again, what I what I feel, what we see is that across the board, you know. At least our clients are are responding to that in in, in various ways, um, and I think we we shouldn't at all underestimate the pressure that will continue to drive this coming from the financial markets, coming from investors, coming from banks. This is you know this is a growing this is a growing trend. Um, it's 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 going it's going only one way. Um, the financiers of, of this sector uh, are going to support the companies that are taking the steps necessary to, to, to meet the objectives that are establishing plans, that are having transparency in their reporting, um, and, and the investors are looking for the same thing when we're talking about public markets. Um, and, and, and I think that will be uh, undoubtedly, because this is such a capital intensive uh, effort, uh, that it, that is that is going to need to be made. Uh, Stamat as well put it. The number of the number of vessels involved to to achieve this transition it's it's huge, and and these vessels are expensive as we all know. So the capital requirement is huge, and so the financiers are are going to play a significant role in 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 in, in producing that 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 continuous pressure to drive to drive improvements. Thank you, Stamat. Yes, a quick comment. Uh, it's very good to talk about the future and we all hope that uh, in 2030 the world's going to be a better place with newer technologies and that. Uh, what we're concerned and very sensitive about as a company is what is happening now. Uh, mm. We have been uh, one of the very few companies out there that in collaboration and partnership with our charters, we have installed energy saving devices on board our ships and we have shared that cost with the charters. So the existing fleet as it stands today can automatically be 10, 15, or even 20% more efficient right now without waiting for ammonia or hydrogen or something in the future. And right mm -hmm. now, you can immediately make the fleet better if the owners and the charterers collaborate and share the cost of the energy saving devices. Most importantly, mm -hmm. like many other people have said, you can always emit fewer uh, carbon emissions if you go slower. If you look at the global uh, VLOC fleet, the very large ore cargos and the Vale Maxis moving from China to Brazil, they are traveling with 15 knots. Look at that. So if you slow down this fleet by 20%, the dead weight adjusted the reduction of emission, the dead weight adjusted the reduction of emission is going to be massive. The bigger the ship, the more it emits. If you move a 400,000 ton ship with 15 knots, can you really imagine how much carbon that emits? If it goes too much slower, the world is going to be immediately a better place. Hmm. Thank you, Stamati. Uh, I'll go to Rasmus, and I, I know that Ted and Peter want to speak. Not Just two that. comments. Uh, one to you, Theo. I mean, uh, I totally agree that, 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 that the world is demanding a much faster transition than what we are capable of in the industry. One thing is what people require of us today, but another thing is what they require us two, three, four, five years onwards from today. And the challenge is, it will take three to five years from regulation is made till the fuels are there. So we can't, the longer we delay these decisions now, the longer we're going to be delayed in meeting the requirements of the future, which is even the requirement of today that we're not able to meet because the technology is not there. Mm. So, so we really need to take that leap step forward now. And it's not okay to wait three years because then in three years time, we're going to be so much even further behind and our industry is going to be totally further uninvestable until we have all the fuels. And again, there's a long lead time. So I very much agree in what, what you say there to you that, listen, society has overtaken us on the requirements from what we are bringing today. So uh, just support to that. Thank you, Rosa. Um, yeah, Peter? Yeah, sorry, George. I was just gonna, gonna say, look, I think, yeah, really interesting sort of points by everyone. I think it, it sort of reflects on, on from, from what I see that there's, you know, there's there's no necessary sort of silver bullet, right? It's a it's a culmination. Uh, I think you know the, the the collaboration and the cooperation, the um, you know the enforcement, um, and maybe that's too strong a word, but I guess that that push from customers, stakeholders, investors, 
is there and that's really positive. I mean, what's happening in some of the, the key areas, as Julian alluded to in Japan, I know some of the work we're doing with, with hydrogen fuel cell trucks in South Africa and, and freight corridors in, in that part of the world, um, you know, is, is all on the back of, you know, that, that push. Um, and, and then there's the carbon pricing piece. Which, which which comes into it, um, you know, as well. So I think, you know, for what I take away is that it's it's a combination of things. It's not just one thing. You know, you want to keep um, fueling and keep incentivising, um, and, and that's certainly our perspective as well, is that we're going to continue to move. We want to keep working with people that are like-minded to try and get to the, to the end goal, which I think we all share. Um, there's some things that can move us there quickly and incentivise us more quickly. You know, that's worth a conversation. Maybe there's a bit of devil in the detail, but certainly the the, the principle, you know, is is, is something that that, that that makes sense for that. But you know, continuing to, to work with others and continuing to collaborate around that common goal, um, and that's certainly what we've experienced as I said in the last few years with things like getting to zero coalition and uh, and and and, and alike. Um, that there is you know a, a lot of positive um, you know sort of I guess energy around. Uh, around this topic, but it's not just one path. It's going to be multiple paths uh, and, and we'll, we're going to need to continue to do that regardless of, you know, I think, um, you know, where we, where we end up on, on, on the structure of a carbon price. Yeah. Thank you. I'll go to Ted and then Julian. Yeah. Just, 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 just quickly. Thank you. Um, I fully support what Stamata said. Um, in terms of the incremental improvements that can be made today and in the next year or two. Uh, and, 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 and those are critically important. Uh, and again, I think that's something we see pretty much all of our clients highly focused on, but I think it really requires, and as, as Peter just said, I mean, it, there, there are several tracks here that I think need to be followed by, by all stakeholders. Um, and, and, and from a ship owner perspective, I think the, the track of focusing on where can I improve incrementally from today till tomorrow, but also, you know, having an eye on, on the more medium term uh, and, 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 and what types of uh, decisions do I need to be making in the future about, you know, the capital investments that are needed in the next generation of ships. Um, and, and I think both of those activities are what, again, I'll come back to the financier, is what the financier is looking for uh, in, in a company today to, to, to get the comfort that they're that they're optimizing their efforts to to meet the objectives that are ahead of them, or targets, I would say, not objectives, targets. Thank you very much, Ted and uh, Julia. Just one very short point, George, if I may, which is uh, you've absolutely need to focus on as as owners if the charters are prepared to pay. And this is always the the commercial point. You are you either. You put in some uh, um, uh, change to your health form, or you put some nice low friction payments, and uh, the charter is prepared to pay for it. That's great, and you should always do those things. It's it's good for the charter, it's good for the environment, it's good for good for the vessel. But I think ultimately we're in the business of trying to build businesses for the long term for the next 10, 20, 30 years, and ultimately you've got to be thinking about what are the cargoes that you're going to be carrying. Right, crude oil in 25 years' time, probably less likely, right? Will it be cryogenic cargoes or other cargoes that we need to, car to, to carry? Probably. What are going to be the commercial officers you need on board those vessels to do it, do it? Do they have the skills? Do you have engineers which have got the right ship-to-ship -ship transfer skills of bunkers, right? Moving um, ammonia or natural gas, and we're finding very quickly, uh, requires a very skilled engine room staff. Where's that staff going to come from? So having businesses which start this very early and build these capabilities and having the, the onshore and the offshore crew which can do this is going to be incredibly important. So I think you've already, you've got to do this today because in five years time, you're not going to have the skills, you're not going to have the staff, you're not going to have the hard assets and ultimately your customers are going to stop doing business with you. So, so I think that the energy saving devices are good for the next short to medium term, but you need to have a core strategy of how you're going to deal with these big, issues which the customers are going to be really pushing on and that's about people and it's about assets as well yep agreed yes. well, thank you i think we're I, i'm getting messages that we are running out of time um i mean i think we could go on easily for another hour uh, and you know the the discussion and the points which were made were made very well 
uh, and I thought, you know, everyone spoke very well from their perspective. Uh, Nicholas, I think, you know, all that's left for me is to thank all the panelists for their participation. Thank you also in Capital Link, uh, all the team, uh, for giving us this opportunity. And, you know, I'm sure that there will be many future discussions um, uh, on this very key and important topic. George, thank you very much for being, uh, first of all, a very skillful moderator. Uh, managing such a high power panel is not easy. And I have to tell you, I personally enjoyed immensely to see the diverse viewpoints uh, and how engaged you all were. Uh, you know, it was a very high, high energy panel. So thank you very, very much. And of course, tremendously uh, insightful. Thank you very much uh, to all of you for, uh, for being with us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, George. Thanks, Nicholas. Bye -bye. Thanks.